we end this um, this week uh, with Gene Toomer, one of my favorite uh, poets, really cool guy. Um, as you can see here from the Poetry Foundation, uh, Toomer um, resisted being classified by race. Um, he attended both all black schools. He attended uh, both all white schools. Um, he's the grandson of the first governor of African-American descent in the United States. I mean, he did not know his father, but he received a, a very, very strong education. And um, his, uh, his, the selections that I've given for you are, are pretty, you know, pretty straightforward. I, you don't really need me to roll through and explain them to you. Uh, but I do want to talk about him for just one second. Um, he was definitely part of the Harlem Renaissance. And while he was in New York, and what you got to realize about New York at this time, in 1950 in Harlem, uh, you know, if you guys have never been to New York City, you know, I lived in New York City for a while, and it's kind of, in a sense, segregated into cultural pockets. Like, you might go through an entire city within the city that's completely Hasidic Jewish or Russian or, uh, you know, like Little Italy or Little Chinatown or Little Korea. Um, so, you know, things are kind of pocketed. And in Harlem, there's a pocket of about 50,000 African-Americans in 1915. And by 1929, this number had grown to 150,000. So, like, it's kind of like, you know, these little places are like their own cities within a city. And the Harlem Renaissance is this kind of literary movement and artistic movement and music movement and plays and all this stuff. It's really, really got some really talented writers like... Um, like um, Zora Hurston, who we already looked at, and Langston Hughes, um, who we're going to look at a little bit later, I believe, and uh, County Colin. Um, and so, you know, he g gets in there, and uh, he was even a teacher in Sparta, Georgia, for a while. Um, but the point is, um, he... Well, his time in Sparta, Georgia here really influenced him and his uh, kind of literary strength kind of lied in between an interplay between uh, kind of presenting a, a, a very simple image of uh, a pure rural black, you know, kind of African-American, that type of subject matter versus like an urban black um, cultural sensibility, you know. And he used a lot of, you know, imagery to put these things forward, which is how it fits into symbolism of Machinism. Um He isn't completely traditional. He does kind of take some ideas of traditional poetry, but, he, but you know, he makes his own forms, his own structures of poetry. They aren't highly experimental, but they're not completely traditionalist. They're, they're kind of in the in the middle. Sometimes they might have a certain length or lot rhyme scheme, but they may abandon, for instance, the rhythms or the stresses and stresses, stress syllables uh, required. Uh, you know, as you can see, we have like some rural poetry here, like in Georgia Dusk, you know, of course, I'm from Georgia. I love anything from Georgia. I think this is a beautiful poem. It's very straightforward. You know, you have those same themes of, you know, racial pride that we see in a lot of work. Um, but let me um, explain this to you. Okay, Cain, this, this, all his poems that you're going to see, most of the stuff you're going to see from these selections are from a book called Cain. And Cain is pretty interesting because it's got short stories, it's got art, like little sketches, it's got poems, even got like a play in it. And it's a three-part work and it's all kind of about um, the kind of theme that runs through it all is, is kind of the representation of an alienated, questing black man who's trying to find his way through uh, kind of, uh, you know, black folk heritage versus, you know, urban life, right? And it's broken into parts. Part one is set in rural Georgia. And it kind of depicts the difficult yet noble life of the rural black population. Part two shows, like you know, it, it kind of has, um, the it centers around black urban life in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, where, and it's kind of the themes are like how the purity of that African-American life has been corrupted by white materialism. 
Um, part three, and it's probably like the most autobiographical, shows an African-American intellectual man, you know, a very intellectual guy, an intellectual, uh, teaching uh, teaching in the South, trying to establish roots. And here's a quote for you. Uh, he tries to establish roots in the style of life that has never known, that he has never known before, but that is nevertheless supposed to be, quote unquote, his. So a lot of the themes are returning to one's roots or trying to and failing or even inventing roots uh, in the absence of having any roots. Um, and this, you know, is persistent. You know, we see this a lot in modern fiction. You know, uh, we saw that with Catherine Ann Porter. Uh, you see it with Thomas Wolfe. Ernest Hemingway writes a lot about that later on. Um, but uh, Kane has um, very poetic language, even his prose, which is, you know, anything not poetry, like paragraphs. Um, it's very imagistic, has a lot of, Im you know, imagery and symbolism. The language is pretty interesting. His word choice is diction. And uh, he's been described as piecing together poems and short stories like mosaics, like little squares that all together come and, and build like a bigger picture. Um, so I hope that you enjoy this guy. He's one of my favorites.